This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. We did it. We finished the whole year talking with some of the top smallmouth anglers across North America. And what a bunch of great information. I know I've been taking notes all year. So this is one of those projects where it was a lot of work, but the outcome and getting through it all uh, was well worth it. And I hope the viewers and listeners and everybody who supported the podcast for the whole year appreciates that. We are going to be doing a season two. Spoil alert, I'm not doing it every week, okay? Uh, It's going to be every other week. And the theme for season two is we're going to be talking with the top local and regional bass anglers across the country. So these could be a uh, local angler that's doing well consistently on his home body of water, or it could be another angler that's that's doing the opens and, and, and ha- is very consistent in those types of tournaments. So we want to really dig in and find out what makes a tournament angler so successful. And I actually did a bunch of interviews already. And so we got some great information for season two. And so I'm looking forward to bringing that every other week moving forward. All right, before we go there, though, of course, we got to talk about the real shot. They've been with us for the whole season. It's quickly become the go-to shop for bass anglers across the country. Bass selections to tackle. You guys know the drill by now. I don't even need the script. They got it all. Mega Bass, Yozuri, Evergreen, Hard to Find Baits, Kitech, Z-Man, Top Brands, Daiwa, Dirty Jigs, St. Croix Rods, and much, much more. Head on over to therealshot.com. Use my code SMALLMOUTHCRUSH15 and get 15% off your first order. So for the final season, I thought it would be best to bring our next guest on and we all he doesn't even need an introduction dave how are you doing tonight i'm good i'm good i i, I i've enjoyed this season to be honest i i i'm not going to lie to you and tell you i listen to every single one but i've listened to a lot of them and and the cool thing is i'm going to listen to a lot of them they don't timestamp themselves you know what i mean like right. it, it really is interesting to see how you know, it just—it's just such a peculiar fish and, and such peculiar people that chase them. You know what I mean? And it I don't is. think it. And I think you can say that about any species, to be honest. Like, we just happen to be obsessed with smallmouth bass, but but mm-hmm. the musky weirdos are just as weird, right? It's it's the obsession that I find the coolest. Why is there so many smallmouth anglers that get so addicted to chasing these fish? What what is it? I really, honestly, I think it's one thing. It's it's the dollar. It's money. When you really think about it, that is the big rise of smallmouth angling. Sure, they're beautiful and they're awesome and the biggest fighting fish pound for pound. But if they didn't win bass tournaments, everybody would still fish for largemouth on the St. Lawrence River. I mean, that's honestly, we live in the golden that's age true. of smallmouth. If you want to compete, like, especially where I'm from, you know, you get north of the border. I'm sure people in New York uh, kind of feel the same and, and deal with a lot of the same it's like one by one all of our lakes have been picked off you know they when i grew up as a kid it was like largemouth smallmouth you know who's gonna win like and it was generally largemouth would win but it's but one by one it's like that lake's now dominated by smallmouth and now this lake's dominated by smallmouth so really i think the reason that the big push was People needed to figure out how to catch these fish just simply because that's what it took to win and and they went from in my lifetime being almost talked about as like mystical creatures you know and i'm Mm. sure you've heard that you know what i mean like people oh they're here today they're gone tomorrow you know they they, they're 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 freaking fabled you know but uh but honestly it it it, i think it all goes down to the dollars like people started chasing smallmouth because they were winning tournaments so take canada for instance obviously you're from canada and i don't know the exact numbers i'm probably going to make it up here but i'm going to say 60 percent of the anglers that we've had over the last year are Canadians. They are truly dialed in. Why is that? I mean, there's smallmouth all over the U.S., all over uh, you know the country. 
granted, southern smallmouth and, and western smallmouth are a little different than the, the beasts of the Great Lakes and in that region, but there is a ton of great anglers out of Canada. You guys have largemouth there, so I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what it is. These guys are truly dialed in and I know you're one of them. I got a bunch of questions. I want to pick your brain, you know, being around the elite anglers on a consistent basis. Is there anything that you see that, that makes an angler stand out that dominates when it comes to smallmouth fishing over say a, a largemouth angler from a different part of the country? I, I think that the same advantage that a Northern smallmouth angler has is the exact same advantage that Ali Livesey has in Texas, the exact same advantage that Kelly Jordan has in Texas, you know, you did and go around the country and replace the names. Mm -hmm. It's comfort. And I think that's the thing that you see, like when you see a lot of Southern anglers and, and pretty routinely, you know, I'll deal with a lot of Southern anglers that at the end of a Northern road trip that are like kicking stones up the road. And that's the <laughs> point when they're like, what, what, what did I do wrong? And I'll always say to them the same thing. You need to come here and invest time. Like, it's literally what you have to do. I mean, I don't care how many books you, it's same with Lake Fork. I don't care how many books you read about catching nine pounders until you've caught a bunch of nine pounders. You're still going to crap your pants when you catch a nine pounder. And that's what you see with the Southern anglers, the way they're fighting the fish at the side of the boat. And it, you almost like if you, a smallmouth hammer almost disrespects the fish. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it sounds horrible, but if you watch Corey or Chris Johnson or Seth Vider or a lot of those guys, I mean, honestly, the exception, the thing that sticks out to me, one exception where a guy that really catches him that doesn't kind of disrespect him as much is Polinick. You know, he'll really play them for a long time. But mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's almost a disrespect, but that comes from catching lots of them and dealing with it a lot. Just like Lee Livesey on Lake Fork. You watch you know, what he did last year, that wouldn't have looked the same if I did it. It probably wouldn't have looked the same if you did it because you haven't caught the literally hundreds of eight pounders in, in northern smallmouth anglers. That's the thing that stands out. They're just, they're so experienced and they know what to expect and none of it shocks them really. Like no matter how bad the weather gets, you know, like these are people who overcome, obviously we're weirdos, right? Like you, right. You think, okay, so how, you know, what's going to change? Well, everything changes for these people, but they still figure out how to catch them. And, and I think that just comes through experience. You know what I mean? Like you, you don't, you know, how do they, how do they run around and not have a fish? And it's 11 o'clock and they're not crapping their pants. But if you see somebody from Georgia, like they are literally freaking out and you'll see, Paul Nick, I mean, the year he won Angler of the Year, like several times I saw him midway through the day and he's like, yeah, I only have two fish. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, how are you not? But they've done it so much. It's happened so many times. And you're doing it on fisheries that literally when you put your head together, you really start to think like, how often do you not get five good opportunities? It, really, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you might screw everyone up. <laughs> but but they're going to come if you just calm down and go through the motion. So I would say the biggest thing that stands out is just their irreverence of the fish. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you just don't respect a four pounder as much as a lot of people would. I definitely see your point there. Absolutely. <laughs> that that makes sense. Speaking of, uh, you know, smallmouth fishing and, and being consistent and catch them. I know you caught a few smallmouth in your time. What would you say if you could pick anywhere to go smallmouth fishing? What? body of water would that be for you probably um the eastern end of lake erie um I, I wouldn't even say probably without a shadow of a doubt that's that's where um that's where i love to be um that uh to me is 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 a phenomenal place i mean the thousand islands is great um but i gotta go erie just because i've invested more time there over the years mm -hmm. you know what i mean like everybody yep. homes always you know, it's just where sure. you need to be. But any of those fisheries, like I, I consider myself spoiled. Like literally, if you drew a triangle around my house where I live, I can go one direction and go to Thousand Islands, go the other direction, go to Erie. And then mm. I can go like 20 minutes north of my house and I can go to Lake Simcoe, which is a world renowned smallmouth fishery. So, you know, I'm pretty lucky that way. Yes, we've had some some studs over the last year that 
basically spend the majority of their time up on Simcoe. And it's amazing the stories that come out of that place. And from what I understand, it's not as easy as it looks, but you can put together a pretty big bag there. 100%. That's the truth. I mean, and the reason I like Erie more than Simcoe, I mean, I'm that much closer to Simcoe, but you don't hear 100 fish days on Simcoe. You know what I mean? Like you hear the odd, like I got 30 to 50 and that's, you stomped them. I mean, that's like 150 fish day on Erie. Really, that's how rare that is. Um, sure. But you're going to get you're going to get some giants. Like you have the opportunity to catch giants there. It's it's just not the number game, and I don't know why it never has you know exploded with the numbers the way it is. But it's, but maybe that's why you get so many big ones there. You know, it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's it's a great lake. It just doesn't have the same numbers that. Um, that Erie does, but, but I can, but Simcoe is, uh, see, Erie's getting close. To, like they're all right there. Like I go through years where I'm like the next record's coming from here. Right. And then you're right. like the next year you're like, boom, 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 boom. Oh, wow. It's going to be thousand islands. Oh, wow. It's going to be, that's the cool thing that we're all dealing with. I mean, it is the golden age of smallmouth fishing. I mean, when I started smallmouth fishing, a five pound smallmouth was elusive. Now a five pound smallmouth is what you need to have in your limit. <laughs> like you just need right. to have five of them all the time. That is that is so true. What what's your favorite technique to target smallmouth? I probably would say a drop shot. You know what I mean? Drop shot. Um, probably caught more smallmouth on a tube in my entire life than anything else, just because it's a freaking tube, and it's mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's 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 all we fished for so long. But prob probably a drop shot. I mean, more often than not, it's just like I don't look at baits like when I say a drop shot, I find myself fishing that more. But it's not like I kind of try to think of things as tools always. You know what I mean? And the drop shot's a great bait. But when you get that slimy moss on the bottom, it might not be that good. <laughs> you sure. know what I mean? So it depends on the situation. But if I had to choose one. I mean, honestly, if I just use one, I'm no different than any other fisherman. I'd like to catch them all in top water, but they don't right. always all <laughs> eat on top water. No, they don't. Speaking of tubes, you know, you mentioned the fact that they produce fish, and we've had some guests in the past, believe it or not, that could probably talk for three hours. And that's what I think is so interesting about the different techniques and the way these guys approach smallmouth fishing, because you can take a guy and literally he will talk for three hours about how to fish a tube but there's a lot that these guys think about that goes into the size weight how to rig the tube what colors i mean if it doesn't have this purple flag in it or or whatever the case they don't want nothing to do with it it's really interesting whether they carolina rig it whether they uh you know drop shot it i mean they could go on and on and that's one thing i found fascinating with all these different anglers is their approach when it comes to all these different techniques spy baiting you can talk to a guy like like Scott Dobson for hours yeah. about that. Incredible. Cal Clemson, one of the guys uh, we 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 talked about with with, with Simcoe. Uh, recent podcast that we just had with an up and coming big stick, which you've had on your show in the past, uh, Cooper. Um, yeah, Cooper. You know they really go deep into the different techniques, and I think that's what makes these guys truly special. Is they know the ins and outs of every technique. Like you were saying, it's a tool, and they know exactly how to apply that. Yeah, and, and they think it to deeper levels than, honestly, even I do. I can imagine. You know what I mean? To be mm -hmm. honest, like, if you really – I've been lucky to catch a lot of big smallmouth. I, I I also live where a lot of big smallmouth live. You know what I mean? I, but there's, there's another level of smallmouth angler. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and you've had – them on this podcast and and i wouldn't throw myself in that category but 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 honestly the more time i've spent with guys like simon frost which i know you had on here with yep. the johnsons with people like that that we you know so many i mean i hate even mentioning one name because then you feel like you should have mentioned a bunch of others right. but um they don't think like i do I'll, because I'll throw a green pumpkin tube and I'm catching them on a green pumpkin tube and I'm happy. Like, why stop? Because I'm fighting fish and that's what I like to do. I've spent enough of my life not fighting fish. <laughs> so I want to spend most of my life doing that. And I've spent literally hundreds of days fishing with Simon Frost. I probably learned more about smallmouth fishing from him than probably any other individual on earth. Wow. But it would be almost comical to me. And I'm taking this way back to simple things like tube fishing. 
he never rested. He never settled. It was always like, yeah, they're eating that color, but they could eat this color better. And <laughs> right. for as much as I thought, you know, you're wrong. That's not the way it's going to work out. Every single time it would always work out where that he'd find that extra little piece. You know what I mean? He'd be, the relentless almost, you know, and it's the same with, I find an area or a transition, but they have to find the extra little bend or the extra little thing that nobody else notices. And that is, mm -hmm. I think that's probably true of every, th every obsession on earth, whether it's freaking playing lawn darts or, or bass fishing, you know, the super elite, the, they do everything different because they True. think about every piece in the engine. You know what I mean? It's not just mm -hmm. how the one piston goes. It's like how everything else is affected, like the degree of their cast and crap like that. I don't think about that. I'm like, I caught it on the left side of the boat. <laughs> Left's been good today. You brought up some big names, uh, some true hammers in the sport. You know, Simon being one of them. Uh, we mentioned the Johnson brothers. We wanted to try to get everybody uh, this this year on the show, and it was a little bit difficult. Uh, a couple key guys that did not, that deserve to be on that list for sure, would be Chris and Corey Johnston, uh, KVD. Heck, even Mark Zona, in my opinion, is a great smallmouth angler. So not even. I mean, he is a freaking right. – <laughs> honestly, I mean, I fish with some of the best smallmouth anglers in the world, and he's right there with every single one of them. Oh, absolutely. What what's your biggest smallmouth? Do you know your personal best? Um, my biggest smallmouth, it, there's some discrepancy around the story. Because <laughs> right? I it was never even weighed. Uh, my biggest oh. smallmouth I've caught. I've been lucky to I know I several years ago I worked out and I had over a dozen over seven, anyways, at that time. So I mean, I there's been some from that, but the biggest smallmouth I ever caught, allegedly was mm -hmm. uh, I took these guys from Texas Parks and Wildlife Fishing, Dave Terry, and he, he had a big deal to do with um, with the TTBC. So forever, it was like his dream, like to go and catch a six-pound smallie. He was right. like, I mean, if I could catch six-pounder. So anyways, I pick up him and Lenny Francoeur, another guy from that event at the airport. We go out fishing, and honestly, the first fish I hook, and it's giant. Like mm -hmm. it's, but I'm Joe Cool, right? I'm, I've, right. I'm got guests. <laughs> I've got to show them Lake Erie and, and it's early in the season. I will, and I'll be honest, it like, this was literally my first trip out there that season. And it happens to me pretty routinely where you do get messed up because they're just, they're so bulbous and so, you don't even know how big they are initially. You know what I mean? Like you mm -hmm. have to weigh a bunch of them. Yep. Um, so this is early in the season. So anyways, I know this is a big fish, but I'm playing Joe cool. And, I go to take it off, like the side of the boat, I kind of hold it up and they take like a quick <laughs> cell phone picture and and I go to like, let it go. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. So Dave Terry, I mean, he's a biologist. He's measuring every fish. Like, uh -huh. so all day, everything that's caught, he's measuring it all and yeah, documenting it all. So he ends up catching a 7-2. Um, so that fish gets let go and everything. He ends up catching a 7-2 that day was his biggest fish of the day, which was phenomenal, uh, unbelievable. And we're at dinner that night. And he says to me, he says, how big do you think that one of yours was? And I was like, and I'm looking at the picture of his seven too. And I'm looking at the picture of mine. I'm like, they're almost identical fish. Like looking mm -hmm. at them, like they're the same shape and everything. And I'm like, so maybe seven too, I guess. And he's like, no way. And he pulls out this little sheet of paper where he's been writing all this down. His seven two was 20... 20 just under 21 inches because that was the thing because you couldn't even have kept it because it was catch and release season then if it, you keep mm -hmm. one over 21 inches so his wasn't even 21 inches and mine was 23 and a half inches Whoa. and it, if you look at the picture of two fish they look so so we kind of decided that it was like eight yeah. two but it's a long story so it's a seven what? or something i guess a 23 23 inch mm. Ooh. That's hard. And, and, that's hard, especially in the Great Lakes. I mean, they, yeah, that's a big it, fish. Huge, huge. But I mean, as an idiot, that's the story of my life, Travis, just so you know. Like everything in my life is awesome, but there's always like a little caveat of bullshit. Like mm -hmm. I caught a giant fish and an awesome fish and I had biologists there and everything with me. Yep. But I wasn't even smart enough to put it in the box and go get it weighed. Don't even know what it weighs. Man. <laughs> It was a good one, though. It so was. I, it I'm was. Gonna have to go with like seven and change, like seven and a half, seven and heavy seven. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll give it to you. All right, guys. We're actually going to take a quick break, and we're going to be right back. 
You're listening to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. Don't rush out to the water just yet. We'll be right back after this break. Hey, I teamed up with Beast Coast Fish to design this killer little jig. Whether you're fishing for smallmouth, largemouth, even spotted bass, this thing is sneaky. Designed with proven fish catching characteristics, it's a tiny little finesse football jig. It's called the Open Water Sniper. Of course, it's smallmouth crush approved. They come in a wide variety of different colors. This one here is Sexy Melon. We got Mothman, Straight Black, Green Pumpkins. So you notice they actually have a few less strands than your standard football jig. No weed guard. You're going to be throwing this the same place you're going to throw an open water, say, exposed hook tube. So anytime you're around that type of structure, it's going to work real well in rocks, hard bottom. And all you're going to be doing is dragging this along. You can do a drag and stop, a continuous retrieve. You can put a little tiny swim bait on the back of that. There's so many different ways you can fish this jig. I've put a TRD on the back of it and looked at them on the graph and dropped straight down and just let it sit there. They're going to hit it. They're going to bite it. The whole point of this jig is to actually emphasize the trailer that you're going to use. So notice the small strands. The hook is very stout. It's perfect. It's got an awesome keeper for your plastics. I've caught so many fish on this this year. It will put more fish in the boat. Go check them out. Hey, listen, they got a lot of other great products as well. BeastCoastFishing.com and pick yourself up the OW, Open Water Sniper Jig, Smallmouth Crush Approved. All right, Dave, good stuff. You know, when we talk fishing, time flies. Take me back to a day on the water, you know, whether something that stands out uh, in your in your mind when you're chasing smallmouth. I mean, there's so many uh, crazy, crazy stories and stuff like that. But I, I think I'm going to have to go with like the first. The, what really made me fall in love with smallmouth bass fishing, really. The lake I live on today was the same lake I grew up on. And it's it's called Scugog. And they call it the bog, whatever. It literally, I think it's this chain of lake is the re, lakes is the reason that so many Canadians do well, literally, if you remove them from smallmouth tournaments, where else do they show up? In Florida, because it's all grass. Like this lake is a mini Okeechobee, basically. Okay. So that it's it's all largemouth. At one time, nobody thought there was any smallmouth here. So this is years ago. I find out there's smallmouth on this lake just from living on the lake. And, and it was fabled. Like nobody's like, there's no smallmouth. There's the odd one. It's like, you know, an mm -hmm. anomaly. It's a largemouth lake. So... I find these smallmouth, and this is back when I was fishing tournaments with buddies, and generally it was just people who had bass boats. I mean, everyone goes through that stage in their life right. where you just, you got a bass boat. Would you like to be my partner? Sure. Um, so I'm fishing with this guy, and, and he wanted largemouth fish in the morning, and I found these smallmouth. And I'm like, these smallmouth were really good, but I only pre-fished them for a few minutes, and he wouldn't go, and he wouldn't go. So finally we go to these smallmouth, and it is to steal – Takumi's line, smallmouth Disneyland, literally was happening. Like mm. we went from catching no fish in the tournament to like every cast you're hooked up. So we end up weighing in at the time, like 22 pounds for the day, which was mega bag at sure. the time. And this is of small Bob Azumi on this podcast, but this is when I realized how smart Bob Azumi is because this was back when we could lock. We can't lock through okay. different lakes anymore, but yep. at the time you could lock through to Sturgeon which is above above Scugog, where I live. And it has smallmouth there. So whenever you saw someone with a big bag of smallmouth, you're like, oh, he made the run to Sturgeon, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone said that. And I didn't, obviously. We didn't. And I said, but I agreed. I'm like, yep, Sturgeon, Sturgeon, of course. Well, Bob Azumi, the next morning, I see him, and he's like, hey, Mercer, you didn't run to Sturgeon. I'm like, well, how do you know that? And he's like, well... I called the lock master and gave him your boat numbers. And I'm like, you son of a, like, I never, even, again, I never thought at that level. <laughs> That's right. the kind of commitment. So it, just the water erupted, the fish were on fire. It was the most unbelievable thing. And people always mm -hmm. say, like, when it's meant to be your time, like, stu stupid stuff happens. And this was the stupidest crap ever. So while we're having this fish fiesta, at some point... Um, we we're throwing tubes and rattle baits was the two ways we would catch them. Um, my partner was throwing a rattle bait, right? And at some point, we're netting fish and everything and putting them in and culling. And he gets back up and he's like, "Where, where's my rod? And I'm like, you must have thrown it in, right? And he's like, no, no, I couldn't have. You'd, I mean, everybody's seen that, whatever. So rod's not there. 
we'll continue on with the tournament. The next day, we we're fishing, <laughs> and I hooked something. I'm fighting it, and this is last day of the tournament, right? So I'm fighting it, and I'm like, it's weird. It's it's you know what it's going right. to be, right? As it starts to get through the water, I see the rod coming towards the boat, and I'm like. Dude, it's a rod. It's a freaking <laughs> rod. And so he gets down. He grabs the rod. You know, right. we're hoping the rod won't fall. The freaking rod had a five-pound sawmouth on the end of it. Start. And I don't know whether it ate it, like, as he started to crank it or mm -hmm. it just had had it. But yep. it, it, that's the kind of crap that has to happen wow. for me to win a tournament, evidently. Wow. <sighs> that's pretty crazy. <laughs> that's a crazy story. It is. Oh. And now <laughs> this, it, this lake is one of those transitions. Like I talked earlier, remember I said, you can't win a tournament here catching largemouth. Like there's some great largemouth, but they just do not compete. Like to win here for largemouth, and it's the same as Thousand Islands, I always say, everything has to go right. You can win on smallmouth where everything goes wrong and you just have the right 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that's, I think the biggest thing, the biggest change in all of our waters. Yeah. So all season long, I've been asking our guests one particular question. I'm really interested in, in what your answer would be with this, but before we go there, I also just want to mention, you know, I have started recording some podcasts for season two and some of the guys, the information that's coming out really blew my mind. Now, of course, this isn't just about smallmouth fishing for season two. We wanted to expand it. So we got guys from California. We got guys from Texas. And I seem to just gravitate, I guess, towards these guys from up north. Mike Tremblay is going to be a guest who's uh, a big time uh, angler on the Great Lakes. Uh, Jamie Bruce talks about some amazing ways to what he calls hanging a minnow. So that episode is going to be coming out here in the next couple of weeks. It's that whole gang up there, Lake of the Woods. So that's some incredible smallmouth fishing up in that zone. It's kind of, it's really interesting if you, if you pick apart the whole continent and look at different sections of smallmouth and how these anglers fish for them, hanging a minnow up on Lake of the Woods versus, you know, dealing with heavy current, big waves on Lake Ontario to, you know, fishing the tail races down on, on the Tennessee River. It's just incredible all the different ways you can catch them and all these studs that are coming out and being able to put together some of these techniques to put these big fish in the boat. It's just, it's incredible. It really isn't the cool little things like you think of Lake of the Woods. I mean, that that brought the fluff. That brought the, mm -hmm. the that's where the marabou came from. I mean, yeah. but there's, it's like little pockets. Like I remember the first time I heard about that, you know, it was like 20 years ago and that yeah. stayed secret for so long and, and shows like this, the internet is destroying all the secrets. It I is. just figured it out. What are you I know. doing? Travis? I, I don't know. It's, it's Gussie's fault. All right. I don't know. I don't know. I, I remember in 2000 and gosh, it must've been 2006, 2007. There's a group of guys that would fish the Sturgeon Bay open out of Wisconsin. And we were just getting started and they were Canadians, of course. And I think it was right around the time, even the Johnsons were, were hitting it hard and they were throwing the smallest, tiniest thing. And we had no clue as dumb as this is because hair jigs have been around forever, right? Like forever. And it looks, even if you see it in the deck of a boat, you're just like, ah, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, what a, it, it nobody, looks like nothing. It took me quite a while. And, you know, you hear from one guy and then another guy and, and then you kind of put the pieces together. And by 2010, we're deep into throwing this thing. And it still catches fish to this day. It's always on my deck. Always. It uh, it was on my deck for years. And I would always just tell people I was crappie fishing. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? And nobody, the first time I found it, a walleye dude showed it to me. Like a guy who used to fish a PWT, John Butts. We, um, Yamaha had a deal with us we got to fish a tournament together and I was mm -hmm. the bass pro and he was the walleye pro and it was a bass tournament on rainy Lake. And it was when the X rap came out because I had like a little satchel of them that nobody had, except for all the guys from, you know, Rapala that fished that tournament, sure. which was half of them. Um, I thought it was a secret weapon though, until the end of the tournament, but uh, I'm up there throwing that X rap and catching fish and, and, and this walleye dude is dragging this thing behind the boat. Like while I'm working my way around, I'm like, Honestly, thinking to myself, what is Walleye Boy doing back there? Mm -hmm. And we got a limit on the jerk bait. And that dude out of nowhere, all of a sudden you hear, wait, 
I got one. And you look and you just see this big carp porpoising way back there. Like it's ridiculously far right. from the boat. It took him all the line on his spool to get the jig down. He called every single fish. Like it, it, it sure. and that's what made me a believer in it. But I mean, that there's some weird little tricks and stuff like that, that the guys, but, it, but it's a shorter window now. It'll never last. Mm -hmm. Like everything gets exposed like that. Yep. It sure does. It sure does. Speaking of that, there's a lot of great baits to catch smallmouth. Every guest over the last 52 guests that we've had, I've always asked this question. The reason why I ask is it's just, it, it reinforces in my mind what that, what bait that angler really relies heavily on or really has a lot of confidence in. Dave, if I was to tell you next year when you're out smallmouth fishing, you're going to only be able to throw one bait and one bait only for the whole season. I don't care how you rig it. What bait for the whole be? season? All year. That's all you can throw. Okay. I know. I got to go. I'm either going to go with like a, a swim bait, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A small swim bait, or I'm probably going to go with uh, the most boring answer in the world. A Maxent flat yes. Yes. Uh, it, it, it Because I got some and hardly anyone seems to be able to get them. So mm -hmm. <laughs> not just that, but no, it, it's a great bait. It is honestly a bait that the reason people are sick of hearing about it is because it's that good. I mean, it, it, it does catch them um and it's a bait that i've kind of been messing with fishing it in different ways um not just as a drop shot so oh, yes. so i think that um i think that's that'd be where i'd go i can't argue with that and you're right the ways to rig that bait besides just drop shot and we've been experimenting with a little bit at this this past fall uh who would have thought it makes a great football jig trailer yeah, it really? really does. Really does. Yeah. Absolutely. I fish a lot in a little darter head and just kind mm. of swim it. You know, it's got yep. it's got kind of especially in current, it's got a cool little fall to it and stuff. So yeah. All right, we're gonna go one step further. Color. I'm I'm going green pumpkin party. Green pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> green pumpkin, but I like saying green pumpkin party better. So yes. Asking this question, there was always some random, some random baits that threw you off guard, but if I was to go back and listen, I'm going to have to say, obviously, the tube, a swim bait like you mentioned, as well as some type of Ned Rig slash stick bait was probably yeah. the most most answers that we've we've gotten over the over the course of the year. But it's fascinating. Everyone will have a specific color. I'm going to tell you, green pumpkin with a little bit of purple, like you were talking, green pumpkin party. That's basically the color of the smallmouth bass. You can't argue that. <laughs> I, I'm I'm going to go as far as to say the bass in general. True, they like green True. pumpkin. If we did like they a do. big, but yeah, definitely the color of the smallmouth bass because uh, I mean the and the other stuff works, but that's just you just like I just think everybody's just caught so many fish on it. You just have that much more confidence in it. Dave, great stuff. We really appreciate you hanging out on the podcast, sharing some of your experiences. Letting us know what makes a true smallmouth angler and the fact that, you know, you love chasing them just as much. All these other anglers watching uh, the YouTube channel as well as the podcast. I know you got a lot going on uh, this coming season. How can people keep up with you and, and what what other things you have going on besides the biggest event on the planet, the Bassmaster Elite Series? Yeah, well, I'll be at all the Elite Series events mm -hmm. in the Classic and then also our new season of Facts Efficient just rolling out right now an outdoor channel and uh, Sportsnet in Canada. And, uh, yeah, all that stuff. And you can follow me on all social medias and, and YouTube and all that same thing. You can find me under Dave Mercer or Dave Mercer's Facts Efficient. I think that's, that's it. Hey, and Easy Travis, enough. thanks for doing this because you know what? Honestly, if you listen to every one of these, I mean, there's fishermen lie a lot and tell a lot of things, <laughs> but they, they, this stuff really, there's meat in every single episode, like every single one of your episodes that I listened to. It doesn't matter who it was, doesn't matter where they fish for smallmouth, but there is two or three little nuggets that I hear. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, and I'm somebody who has spent my entire life with some of the best smallmouth sure. anglers there is. And I'm mm -hmm. learning stuff like that. So thank you for putting together such a cool concept because some guys just put podcast together that are just people talking about drivel and bull crap <laughs> this is real this, you're gonna learn 
No, I appreciate that. And, it, you know, the biggest thing that I learned from this whole thing was, you know, week three into it, I know nothing about smallmouth compared <laughs> to these guys. And it just blew my mind and my pocketbook. You know what I mean? Every time, every time I got to hit the tackle store. But good stuff. Listen, you're always welcome back. We really appreciate it for coming well, out. Thanks for having oh, me on. Good. Hold on. That was dumb. Yeah, it was bad. That I thought you terrible. were better at this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 all right dave really appreciate you coming on the show you're always welcome back happy new year's of course yeah, happy new year's to you too i can't believe it. it's here yeah it's here happy 2022 20, it's gonna be better than all the the giant years. yeah make sure you got a scale in your boat next time i want to see a big eight eight and a half pounder this year from you okay this year Sounds i'm cool. focused this year is but this year is re-engaging in the sport just nice. so you know i've been pushed away by all this crap and these cool things i get to do but yes. next year i'm going freaking fishing more i love it i love it and as Happy always New guys year. until next time we'll see you on the water all right that was a good ending my god <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.